Go ahead and open up your Bibles to the end of the book of Philippians, chapter 4, will be in verses 10 through 23. As I thought and as I, uh, as I prayed about the sermon this week, I wanted to reach out to one of my dear friends in the ministry. His name is Chris Shirell. Um, you probably have seen his uh, missionary card out in the lobby. It's been out in the basket for probably about two years now. Um, As some of you may know, uh, Chris and his wife Miranda and their two sons, uh, Harlan and Benjamin, uh, they are missionaries to the country of Japan. So I called up Chris uh, and we talked on Facebook video chat for a few hours this week and it just so happened by the uh, providence of God that I was talking with Chris on Wednesday and the kids were showing up for youth group And Chris was very generous to spend some of his time uh, just talking with our kids, with our youth, about what it's like to be a missionary. And one of the things that he mentioned was how hard-hearted, surprisingly hard-hearted, the Japanese people are. He said that the people there just don't care. They just don't care about Christianity or their souls or Jesus Their culture is boiled in and is saturated with and consumed by the false religions of Shintoism and Buddhism. And I got to thinking, the culture of modern-day Japan is a lot like Paul's circumstance in the ancient city of Rome. Obviously, Chris isn't under arrest, praise the Lord, like Paul was, but the cultures of ancient Rome and modern Japan are quite similar. Christianity is virtually non-existent. Most have never heard the name of Jesus Christ, and their hearts are hardened to the gospel by centuries of idol worship. And Chris told me one of the things that makes evangelism so hard in Japan, not only the fact that there's a language barrier, but their religion is so intricately tied up in their cultural identity. Many Japanese people are resistant to even consider the claims of Jesus Christ because to do so is fundamentally un-Japanese. And that was the case in the Roman Empire as well. You can see this, if you're looking for evidence of this, you can see it in the names of first century Christians. For example, the uh, member of the Philippian church who delivered uh, uh, the gifts to Paul and delivered the Paul's letter back to the Philippians. His name was Epaphroditus. You know what Epaphroditus means? It means loved by Aphrodite, the Greek goddess of lust. So to become a Christian in the ancient Roman Empire was tantamount to rejecting your nation in favor of something else. And then Chris spoke about the loneliness that he sometimes experiences in a situation like that. Yes, he's part of a small Japanese church, but those Christians are somewhat immature, and the language barrier makes deep friendships difficult. Now again, Chris's situation is not exactly like Paul's, but as I read over, as I read over our text and I prayed over our text today, I, I tried to think about what it's like to be a missionary like Paul in a city that barely has any Christians. It's extremely challenging because you're isolated from your family and the support system of your home church. So while I read the text today, I want you to think about what it would be like to be in Paul's situation. Listen to how Paul speaks because of the gifts that the Philippians sent him. So Hopefully you have it open. Join me in the book of Philippians, chapter 4. I'll read from verse 10 to the end. Paul says, I rejoiced in the Lord greatly, that now at length you have revived your concern for me. You were indeed concerned for me, but you had no opportunity. Not not that I'm speaking of being in need, for I have learned in whatever situation I am to be content. I know how to be brought low, and I know how to abound. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. Yet, it was kind of you to share my trouble. 
And you Philippians yourselves know that in the beginning of the gospel, when I left Macedonia, no church entered into partnership with me in giving and receiving except you only. Even in Thessalonica, you sent me help for my needs once and again. Not that I seek the gift, but I seek the fruit that increases to your credit. I have received full payment and more. I'm well supplied, having received from Epaphroditus the gifts you sent, a fragrant offering, a sacrifice acceptable and pleasing to God. And my God will supply every need of yours according to his riches in glory in Christ Jesus. To our God and Father be glory forever and ever. Amen. Greet every saint in Christ Jesus. The brothers who are with me greet you. All the saints greet you, especially those of Caesar's household. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. And thus ends this reading of God's holy and errant and his inspired word. May he write its eternal truths on our hearts. So now let's, let's pray and ask for the Lord's help to understand these things and to obey them. Heavenly Father, we pray that as we conclude our study of the book of Philippians today, that you would help us to be like the Philippians. Lord, please help us to be committed to enabling and funding the spread of the gospel so that your rule and your reign may spread as far as the authority of Jesus Christ extends. He has all authority, Lord. Father, we pray that your kingdom would come and your will would be done on earth as it is in heaven. Lord, help us to see the meaning in, in those words. Your kingdom in heaven is all extensive, and your will is done without rebellion there. And Lord, we pray that those things would come to pass on the earth. We pray that your kingdom would fill the whole earth, and we pray that your will would be done throughout the whole earth without rebellion. And we believe according to your word that this day will come. We don't pray in vain. So Lord, we ask you that it would come soon. And may it come, Lord, in small part by the preaching of the gospel that is enabled and funded by our church. Lord, we ask also that you would teach us to be content as Paul was content. Lord, give us confidence in your providence that enables us to give to the cause of world missions. And Lord, please cause us to rest in your Son so securely that we, we, don't, we don't lose our marbles when things around us are less than ideal. Heavenly Father, I ask these things and I acknowledge that these are things that only you can do. They will not happen without your working. And so, Lord, we appropriately ask you these things in the name of the mediator which you've provided. So in the name of Jesus Christ, and by virtue of our union with him, we ask you these things. Amen. Now here at the end of Paul's letter, he wants to wrap it up by thanking the Philippians for the gifts that they sent him. So apparently what has happened is that the Philippian church has gotten together, and they've pooled their resources to send some things to Paul that would sustain him and would encourage him during his imprisonment. Now, we don't know exactly what these gifts were. It could have been money. It could have been clothing. It could have been parchments or books or some combination of those things. But ultimately, it doesn't matter. Right? The nature of the gifts aren't really relevant to the way that Paul received them. So there's, there's three things there's three main sections in this last part of the letter. So, verses 10 through 13, what we see is we see Paul's attitude toward receiving the gifts. That's verses 10 through 13. And then in verses 14 through 20, we see Paul reflecting on the Philippians' history of supporting him and the result of their giving. And then finally, in verses 20 through 23, we see the conclusion and the benediction. And I'm going, to prob I'm going to spend most of my time on the first section, verses um, 10 through 13, and we'll sort of move quickly through the other two sections. So again, let me repeat myself. The first section, verses 10 through 13, 
Paul informs the Philippians about his attitude toward his circumstances and his attitude toward the reception of the gift that they sent. He says in verse 10 that he rejoiced greatly at their revived concern for him. And then if you were paying attention closely, you might have noticed how in the first sentence of verse 10, he says that their concern was revived. But then in the second sentence, he says that their concern has endured, but they just had no opportunity to express it. So obviously, Paul intends to be understood according to two senses of the word concern. So in one sense, the Philippians concerned for their concern for Paul never wavered. The Philippian church never stopped praying for Paul. They never stopped wondering what was happening to him. The Philippians had heard about how Paul had been arrested during one of his missionary journeys and how he had been shipped off to Rome, and they had never ceased to pray for him. So in that sense, their concern never wavered. But there was another sense in which their concern had died out. Well, what was that? It was that their inward concern had no outward opportunity to express itself. In other words, something happened that hindered the Philippians' ability to send tangible, financial, material support to Paul in his imprisonment. And well, we we don't know we don't know exactly what it was. But listen to how listen to this. Listen to how Paul described the Philippian church in 2 Corinthians. Now, before you hear this, just know that you're going to hear the word Macedonia. Macedonia is a region, and Philippi is in the region of Macedonia. It's a rather small region. Um, uh, Thessalonica and uh, Berea is there. So, listen to this. This is 2 Corinthians 8, 8, 1 through 2. He says, We want you to know, brothers, about the grace of God that has been given among the churches of Macedonia. For in a severe test of affliction... Their abundance of joy and their extreme poverty have overflowed in a wealth of generosity on their part. So the Philippian church was known for their sacrificial giving to fund the advance of the gospel. And Paul says that they were so sacrificial that they gave even through their severe test of affliction. But for whatever reason... Something has happened that has prevented the Philippians from sending Paul's support. It seems that for, if the Philippians are going to stop giving, something really bad has happened. Either it's just been really bad economically, and I mean really bad. Like Paul says, it's a severe test of affliction. Or maybe they were just enduring a great season of persecution. Or maybe they just lost track of Paul. Whatever, whatever happened, we don't have reason to think that Paul's being sarcastic or he's being double-tongued when he says that they had no opportunity to express their concern. They really didn't. But now, at last, their tangible expressions of concern for Paul and for his ministry, for the spread of the gospel, have been revived. The Philippians have finally come through in sending gifts by the hands of Epaphroditus, who you can read about in chapter 2. The Philippians, you know, Paul says that in seeing these gifts, you know what his heart response was to seeing these gifts from the Philippians? It filled him with great joy in the Lord. And it probably would do the same for you, too, if you were in Paul's situation. Imagine that you're Paul in a foreign city, away from all of your family, and you're forced to rely on other people for your every need because you can't work. All the while, other so-called Christian preachers in the city are slandering your name for your imprisonment. That would probably be a really discouraging situation to be in. And then one day, there's a knock at the door, and the Roman guard that you're chained to goes to the door, and he opens it, and look, 
It's Epaphroditus. It's one of the Philippians. And he's got in his hands or in his cart a bunch of gifts that they have sent to you, even though they are enduring a severe test of affliction. I don't know about you, but if, if I were Paul, I would be rejoicing in the Lord too. Notice how he says he was rejoicing in the Lord. Here we see one of the sweet results or effects of union with Christ. We're united to Christ, our Savior, right? Not only do, you know, when I, whenever, typically when I explain what is union, it's this. We get what Jesus gets. We're married to Christ. We're we're in him, right? And so everything that counts for him counts for us. But one of the effects of that is that we're in Christ with other people too, right? We have been given a bond with other believers that is tighter than any other natural human relationship. We are one in Christ. And so of course Paul rejoices in the Lord because the Lord is the one who made this gift possible, by uniting him to the Philippians in the sweet bonds of brotherly love in Christ. Now, from what Paul has just said, he doesn't want the Philippians to get the impression that his contentment, his joy in the Lord, is contingent upon the reception of a gift. And so, in order to save the Philippians from the burden of thinking that, he says in verse 11, not that I'm speaking of being in need, for I have learned in whatever situation I am to be content. And then he gives some extreme examples on one end and on the other end of where he can be content. And the implication is that he can be content in every situation in between those. He says, I know how to be brought low and how to abound. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. So do you see how he uses both ends to the, of the spectrum to describe everything in between? Right? Every circumstance. Well, how can you say that, Paul? Right? You're in prison, right? Kind of stinks for you, doesn't it? Paul, you, you would be a little bit justified to be discontent. Is he? Paul has learned to be content in whatever situation he could encounter. Now, that is a secret. That is a secret that I need to learn. And that is a secret that I know that you need to learn. We are very good at noticing and whining about the things that make us uncomfortable. And just so you know, I am pointing the finger at myself. And if you happen to be behind me, then okay. I ask myself, John, are there some circumstances where you would probably find it extremely hard to be discontent? And I, I say back to myself, absolutely. Kids, Think with me for a moment. Think about your favorite toy or your favorite stuffed animal. Think about that thing. And now think about how you would feel if that thing was taken away from you and you could never get it back. <laughs> My son likes it when I tell him stories. And one time I told him a story about how a big tornado came and sucked up all his toys. And he lost it, dude. He bawled. He was not happy. But it was a great opportunity for me to express to him this truth. Adults, think for a moment about what circumstances in your life could cause you to be discontent. What if you lost your job? What if your house burnt down? What if you went to jail and were unable to work to feed your family because of your stand for the truth of God's word? So imagine the most difficult situation that you can think of. And Paul says there's a secret for being content even in that situation. But notice that contentment isn't just for times of need. 
It's also for times of plenty. Paul says he, he knows the secret to being content in situations of abundance. He knows how to be content in situations of plenty. Isn't it true that the wealthiest people in our culture are often the most unhappy? Look at how lavishly the Hollywood elite live. And is it, an ever, is it ever enough for them? No. Now, I, I know that nobody in this room is filthy rich like that. But I know that God has blessed some of you with above average means. So my question then becomes, how content are you? Are you often thinking about that new whatever, that new car, new boat, that next and better vacation, that new gun, that new whatever? And I say, I say all that to say that discontentment is not a thing for the poor only. Discontentment is a thing for the, for the rich, for the wealthy, for everyone. Everybody struggles with it. So how do we fight it? I'll tell you what's not the secret. What's not the secret is remembering how good you have it, right? The secret content to contentment is not saying to yourself, well, hey, you know what? Cheer up, self. At least I have more than those starving kids in Africa. I am so sick and tired of hearing Bible-believing Christians use that kind of un ungodly, un satanic logic. By that logic, are you saying that Paul's stupid? Because he just said that he can be content in whatever circumstance, any situation, even the situation of the starving kids in Africa. So if Paul was in that situation, he says, I know the secret. Your solution to discontentment cannot be tied to your possession or lack thereof of material possessions and belongings. So what is the secret? Verse 13. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. Oh, how many times this verse has been abused in the attempt to win a football game or to lift some record weight at the gym. Don't lie to me. You've done it. How many times has this verse been ripped out of context to suggest any number of things. And here's what, pe here's what trips people up. They get confused by that word all there. See, it says all. Right? That means I can grow wings and fly to China. And, you know, all of those who read our Bibles carefully, we just, we do one of those. Here's an example. When a bank robber goes into a bank and he says to the teller, give me all your money, do you think that he's referring to all the money in that teller's 401k account? No, he's not. He's talking about all of the money in their cash till, right? So in the same way, Paul doesn't mean that we can do all things in the sense that we can grow wings and fly to China. He means that he can be content in all things. He can be content in every and any circumstance. That's what Philippians 4.13 means. Paul's saying, hey, yeah, you know this prison thing? I can do that with contentment because of this secret that I know. So what's the secret? He does all things through the one who gives him strength. That's the secret. So who's the one who gives Paul strength? Well, it's Christ, of course. Paul, how can you be content in any circumstance, whether in need or in plenty? How is it that we can escape this endless battle with finding our situations intolerable? Through Christ. What does that mean? What, through him. Through Christ. What, what does that mean? I think, that, I think that John Piper has a really fantastic definition, and it's the one that I want to recommend to you. The secret of through Christ is this. It's seeing and savoring or treasuring or enjoying or being satisfied in Christ himself as supremely valuable. That's the secret. Being satisfied in Christ himself as supremely valuable, that is the way that we can do all things with contentment. We can be content in need and hunger by being satisfied in Christ and 
seeing him as supremely valuable. We can be content in abundance and in plenty by seeing and savoring and treasuring Christ as most valuable above all else. We've seen Paul talk about, we've seen Paul talk this way already in the book of Philippians, haven't we? It's everywhere. But I'll just point you to two main places. In chapter 1, Paul expressed that his ultimate hope, his ultimate aim in life, was that Christ would be honored, whether by Paul's living or by Paul's dying. How's that possible? Chapter 1, verse 21. For to me, to live is Christ, and to die is gain. How can dying be gain? Only if, by dying, we will gain entrance to the presence of the one who is supremely valuable. So, Christ was what was most valuable to Paul, and so Paul says, in him, I have everything and anything that I need. And then, I, he probably says it more explicitly in chapter 3, verse 8. He says, indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. So, the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus overshadows and eclipses both the lack and the possession of worldly material goods. Through Christ, you can have the same degree of joy when you abound as when you are in need, and the same degree of joy as when you're in need as, when you, as if everything were abounding. So how can we be content in any circumstance? Where will you get the strength to be content in anything that you can endure? Only through Christ. Only through viewing him as your supreme joy and your supreme treasure. You will only, listen closely, you will only ever be content if you can say, and it's true, all I have is Christ. If, if I have him, I have everything. He is my life. Or in the words of the song that we sang, take the world, but give me Jesus. All its joys, pff, give me Jesus. That's, that's the only way you're going to be content. That is the secret, ladies and gentlemen. So, that's the first section. Again, <clears throat> verses 10 through 13 reveal the way that Paul received the gift with joyful contentment in Christ. So, the next section. Let's look again at verses 14 through 19. That's the Philippians' history of support and the results of their giving. So, in verse 14, he says, Yet it was kind of you to share my trouble. So, for Paul, <clears throat> although he has just reassured the Philippians that, that he didn't need the gifts to be content, he wants them to know that he received the gifts as a gesture of their kindness. And that's the same way that we should receive gifts. That's the same way that we should receive material possessions, right? Although a Christian can and should be content in any circumstances, we do not need to reject the kindness of others or the Lord. And then in verses 15 through 16, he rehearses their past history of support of him. He says, and you Philippians yourselves know that in the beginning of the gospel, when I left Macedonia, no church entered into giving and receiving except you only. Even in Thessalonica, you sent me help for my needs once and again. So, in essence, Paul is saying, thank you. Thank you, Philippians, for your kindness in sending me these gifts. And you and I both know that you have always supported me in generous terms, in kind, loving terms. But then in verse 17, he goes back again to say, not that I seek the gift, I seek the fruit that increases to your credit. Now, there's something interesting here that you might have caught, I don't know. The Philippians, their sending of a gift to their missionary Paul is a way that their spiritual fruitfulness increases. What are the fruits of the Spirit? 
love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Didn't, what did Paul say in verse 14? He said, it was kind of you to share my trouble. You see, the fruit of the Spirit aren't just general dispositions of temperament. The fruit of the Spirit consists of actual, tangible acts of kindness that spring from a heart of love to God and a desire to see His name glorified. That's what Paul wants to see. More than him getting gifts, he wants to see them, the Philippians, this church that he's planted, bearing the fruit of the Spirit's work of sanctification in their lives. That's what he wants to see. What else does he say? He describes the effect and the nature of their gifts in verse 18. He says, I have received full payment and more. I am I'm well supplied, having received from Epaphroditus the gifts you sent, a fragrant offering, a sacrifice acceptable and pleasing to God. So, after he describes the way that he received uh, the gifts, he describes the gifts as a fragrant offering. It's a sacrifice. It's acceptable to God. So here is a truth that you need to know and you need to beat it into your brains. The sovereign Lord is not impotent without your money. Okay? The same Lord who in Matthew 17, 27 can make a copper coin, or I'm sorry, not a copper coin. I don't know what kind of coin it was. It was a coin appear in the mouth of a fish, right? And the same Lord who says in Psalm 24, 1, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and those who dwell therein. That God doesn't need your stupid money to accomplish his purpose, okay? When God demanded sacrifices in the Old Testament, it wasn't because he was hungry. It wasn't because he had a hankering for some steak, okay? God wanted their sacrifices because they were tangible tokens and testimonies in their belief in his word and their thankfulness for his provision. In fact, in the Old Testament, when the people were offering sacrifices as just sort of lip service to God, he says in Hosea 6.6, 6, For I desire steadfast love and not sacrifice, the knowledge of God rather than burnt offerings. God did not delight in their offerings. Why? Because they were offered from the wrong heart. I don't want that crap. But the Philippians, their gifts to God offered in their giving to Paul, were offered up in the spirit that the Lord loves. These gifts were not offered to earn God's favor. They were not offered to placate a needy God. They were not offered for the purpose of earning the favor of a minister or a missionary. But they were offered out of a heart of steadfast love to the Lord. Is that the way that you offer the work of your hands to the Lord? Is that the heart you have in bringing your gifts? Do you view it as just paying to keep the lights on here? Do you view it as just, we're going to pay some salaries? No. I know most of your hearts. You offer your gifts, not to please man, but to please the Lord. God doesn't need your gift. But your gift offered up from a heart of belief, from a right spirit, will be used by the Lord to sustain the work of the ministry, and it will be pleasing to him. It will be a fragrant aroma. Now look with me at verse 19. <clears throat> Paul says, And my God will supply every need of yours according to the riches of glory in Christ Jesus. Does your unbelief in this verse keep you from giving? I mean, it has for me in the past. I've bought into the notion that, well, 
you know, because I'm just struggling financially right now, it's unwise for me to give to the church. And if, if you're thinking that, I want you to know that I understand that concern. I understand the concern of what it's like to be financially unstable. But do you want to know a verse that really kicked me in the butt lately? When I read this, I almost, I almost wept because of my unbelief. Listen to Luke 21, verses 1 through 4. Jesus looked up and saw the rich putting, in, putting their gifts into the offering box. And he saw a poor widow put in two small copper coins. And he said, Truly I tell you, this poor widow has put in more than all of them, for they, con- for they all contributed out of their abundance. But she, out of her poverty, put in all that she had to live on. Paul says that God will supply every need of yours. Maybe it's possible that God knows your needs better than you do. God knows that you need to trust him instead of being anxious. Maybe you need to reconsider what some of your perceived needs are. Oh, and by the way, did you notice by what measure God will meet our needs? According to his riches in glory in Christ Jesus. God will, in the age to come, bless you in Christ with riches far superior than money. Remember what Jesus said? Matthew 6, 19 through 20. Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven. So maybe... Maybe God intends to supply your needs at a different time or in a different way than you may expect. Perhaps the Lord knows that you have a need to be humbled. Now, before we move on to application, I want to make a few comments on the last section, the conclusion. And at first, it might seem that Paul forgot that he ended the letter at verse 20, right? He said, amen, right? That's the end. (laughs) Well, yes and no. <clears throat> See, it was very common back in this day to dictate letters. You know, we know for sure that Paul did this several times, like with the letter to the Colossians and the second letter to the Thessalonians, and I think that's probably what's happening here. Paul dictated the letter up to verse 20 and then wrote verses 21 through 23 with his own hand, which the Philippians would have been able to recognize without him telling them because he, they knew him very, very well, and they could identify his handwriting. Ultimately, that doesn't matter. What matters is what he says. In verse 20, he ascribes glory to our God and Father forever and ever. This is a standard way for Paul to end a letter. And in it, he expresses his hope and his belief that God will receive glory forever and ever. The ultimate purpose of creation and redemption is that God would receive glory forever and ever. Remember Philippians 2, verse 11? And every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Here's the deal. It's God's world, and he ought to get from it what he wants. And if we love him, we ought to be glad when he is glorified. And we will be glad forever and ever as we will revel in his glory throughout all eternity. And then in verses 21 through 22, he sends them general greetings, sort of like a hello at the end of the letter. This was a very common thing to do in Greco-Roman letters. He greets all the saints— And he also expresses greetings from those who are with him, especially those of Caesar's household. It's likely that he's referring to the members of the Praetorian Guard that were keeping watch over him that he mentioned in chapter 1, verse 13. And, you know, we hope that some of them came to believe the gospel over the course of guarding him. And then 
in verse 23, he closes by wishing that the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ would be with their spirit. This means that he hopes God's grace would come to them in Christ to comfort them in their inner person. And of course, this is a promise which God guarantees to all his elect. So it's not improper to pray for things that God has promised will come. So now that we've, we've finished Philippians, how, do we, how are we to apply these verses? Well, first, anxious Christian. Christian who struggles to be content. Remember that God promises His grace, His strength in Christ, is and will be sufficient for you in every season. There is not a single circumstance you can endure in which God has not equipped you to put away anxiety and to put on contentment. Through Christ, you can have strength to live with contentment even in worse circumstances than you have right now and even in better circumstances than you have right now. If Christ is your greatest treasure, the possession of earthly wealth will not give you any more spiritual joy in this life. So why do we who are relatively wealthy in the West cling so tightly to our money? Or on the other hand, why do we freak out and lose our marbles when things are, when times are tight? And I'm speaking mainly to myself. So unbeliever, do you possess Christ? Do you view him as supremely valuable and satisfying? Here's the deal. If you don't, you will never find any satisfaction in anything. And you will spend an eternity in separation, dissatisfied and discontent, in agony, away from him. So, unbeliever, look to Christ today by faith. See the salvation from sin that is available in him. See that in offering you salvation, what he's offering you is himself. So, unbeliever, receive Christ. Receive him today, and you will receive a contentment that goes beyond words, that is inexpressible and filled with joy. Now, brothers and sisters in Christ, we have before us today a fantastic opportunity to be a church like the Philippians, a church that supports foreign missionaries. I think it's providential that the Lord has allowed me to preach this sermon right before our monthly members meeting. Danny and I want to recommend to you that now is the time to restart our financial giving to overseas missions. Every Sunday, we pray for a country of the world where the gospel is not widely known. But as of right now, we are not currently giving any money to support this work. And why? Well, historically, in the past, our giving to missions has been through the Southern Baptist Convention. However, because of the recent leftward drift in the Southern Baptist Convention, and per Danny and I's recommendation, last year we suspended our support to the SBC Cooperative Program. Those who run the SBC Co-op Program have demonstrated themselves to be unworthy and therefore untrustworthy unworthy of our trust for our missions giving. We, for better or for worse, are somewhat like the Philippian church in verse 11. Sorry, verse 10. Our concern for our overseas missionaries has not had an outlet over the past year or so. But the good news is, brothers and sisters, we have an opportunity like that before us today. So what can we do today? Danny and I, together, we want to recommend that we as a church begin supporting the Shirelles, Chris and Miranda, in their ministry to Japan. Some of you have met them before because they have visited our church back in June 2020. You know, I spoke with Chris and Miranda this week, and they said something to me that just blew me out of the water, and it, and it filled me with such joy and pride to be an elder here. They said that some of you regularly reach out to her and let them know that you are praying for them. And I want you to know 
that when I heard that, <clears throat> I, almost, I almost broke into tears. You know who you are. For those of you who have never met Chris and Miranda, Katie and I, along with Danny and Jamie, can personally vouch for their integrity and for their heart for the Lord. Danny was a member of Chris's ordination council, and Chris was one of the groomsmen at my wedding. He is a man that we know well and we trust. Danny and I have examined him theologically, and we are confident that he is in full agreement with our church doctrinal statement. Chris and his sweet wife, Miranda, have demonstrated their commitment to this call by enduring four years of missionary deputation. Deputation is basically where it's your full-time job to travel around and visit different churches to raise your own support. It is a, it is a brutal and is a challenging time, and they did it for longer than most missionaries do. And just as they were about to head out to Japan, they were fully funded. COVID hit. And they were prevented from entering. But this February, Chris and Miranda, they were considering that it might be time, it might be time to give up trying because the country was so locked down. And our home church, Graceway Baptist Church in Springfield, Missouri, hosted a 12-hour prayer chain to pray that Japan would open their doors to them and other missionaries to enter the country. And listen to this. Within three hours of that prayer chain starting, Japan announced that they were opening their borders. So finally, in March, they made it to Japan. So we're going to give you some more information in our members meeting, and we're going to discuss what it would look like to send them regular financial support. But I don't, I don't, I don't just want to offer them regular financial support. I think that it would please the Lord it would greatly encourage Chris and Miranda if we were able to send them a gift like the Philippians sent to Paul. Here's the deal. If the Philippians were able to give even through a severe test of affliction, we should be able to give in our stable condition. In a world where most Christians need to have their arm twisted in order to share their gospel with their coworkers, Chris Shirell spends two hours each day each weekday, driving back and forth to language school so he can learn Japanese so that he can share the gospel. And because of this, Chris told me that he is in need of another vehicle. He has one in mind that is in fantastic condition, low mileage, and it costs about $4,000. I have prayed, and it is my burden to present to you May Pearl Street Reformed Baptist Church be like the Philippians and offer a sacrifice that is acceptable and is pleasing to God by sending them the money to purchase this car. So here's the deal. We've been talking about the Shirelles for a long time, but this car thing is new information. So what, here's what Danny and I want you to do. Over the next month, we want you to prayerfully consider making a sacrificial offering above and beyond what you normally give to the church in order to bless this missionary family. When you give, just designate it on the envelope or on your check that it's a check for the Shirelles, and if you can't remember their name, just write for the Japanese missionaries. And as you discuss with your family what you can give, put Philippians 4, 10 through 23 into practice. Consider that your gift is not primarily a gift for Chris and Miranda. It is a fragrant offering that you can offer, and the Lord will be pleased if you do it out of an abundance of thankfulness to the Lord. Have your ultimate aim in your giving to please Christ. Don't try to please Chris and Miranda, and don't try to please Danny or me. Try to please the Lord. And I'm confident with Paul that my God will supply every need of yours according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, please help us to be like the Philippians. Lord, you know my heart. You know my love for Chris and Miranda. Lord, please help me and help this church be sacrificial in the way that we give. 
Lord, we do that. We do this not to give you money, Lord, because you lack anything, but because from your abundance you have blessed us and met us, met our every need in Christ Jesus. So, Lord, please help us. Lord, please use us as one of your means that you use to bring the kingdom to the earth. May, through the mouth of Chris Shirell, may the gospel go forth mightily and with power by the work of the Spirit. And God, would you plant the seeds, the little mustard seed in Japan through Chris, and would you cause it to sprout into a tree that fills the whole earth and the whole land of Japan? We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.